The old wooden sign hung above the narrow door, creaking softly in the wind. Its faded letters read, Curiosities and Concoctions, in an archaic, hand-painted script that seemed to glow under the dim, flickering streetlight. The shop itself was nestled at the end of a forgotten alleyway, hidden from the bustling city streets, as if the world had simply forgotten it existed. Inside, the air was thick with the smell of old wood, dried herbs, and something else. Something acrid and metallic, like a faint hint of blood. Dust motes danced in the beams of light, filtering through the cracks in the boarded up windows. The shop's walls were lined with shelves that sagged under the weight of ancient tomes, glass bottles of all shapes and sizes, and strange objects whose purposes were better left unexplored. The shelves were cluttered with an eclectic collection of items, dried animal parts, twisted roots, shimmering powders, and vials filled with glowing liquids in every colour imaginable. An old cuckoo clock hung on one wall, its hands frozen at a time long past, a silent witness to the shop's secrets. A black cat sat perched on a high shelf, its yellow eyes following every movement with a knowing gaze. Behind the counter stood the shopkeeper. He was a tall, thin figure, cloaked in a dark, old-fashioned coat that seemed almost too large for his frame. His face was obscured by a wide-brimmed hat that cast a shadow over his sharp features, but his eyes, a deep, unsettling shade of grey, shone with a strange light. His hands, pale and slender, moved with a practiced grace as he polished a brass mortar and pestle, his fingers tracing the worn engravings on its surface. He was an ageless man, impossible to place in any specific era. His presence seemed to resonate with an aura of quiet authority, a sense that he had seen and known things far beyond the understanding of ordinary people. He hummed softly to himself, an old, eerie melody that seemed to echo off the walls, filling the shop with a sense of unease. The shopkeeper glanced at a large, ancient ledger on the counter, its leather cover cracked and worn with age. The pages were filled with names written in a flowing script, each entry accompanied by a description of a potion, a date, and a curious symbol beside it. Some names were crossed out, while others seemed to glow faintly, as if infused with a hidden power. A soft chime rang through the shop as the front door creaked open. The shopkeeper's lips curled into a faint smile as he looked up. It was always the same. Those who found their way to his shop were drawn by something deep within them, a desire, a need. He could sense it, smell it in the air like the first hint of rain before a storm. He turned to the large wooden cabinet behind him and opened its ornate brass doors. Inside, rows upon rows of vials glinted in the dim light. He ran his fingers along them, each one carefully labelled in his spidery handwriting Elixir of beauty, draught of love, tonic of power, brew of healing. He paused, feeling the familiar thrill that came before a new customer arrived. There was always that moment, just before the door opened, when he felt the possibilities stretching out before him. Each customer brought a new story, a new decision, a new test. Some left the shop changed forever, others never left at all. He chuckled softly to himself, a sound that seemed to blend with the creaking of the old wooden beams above. He knew what was to come, and he knew that the choices made within these walls would shape fates, for better or for worse. The chime sounded again, louder this time, as the door opened wider and a figure stepped hesitantly across the threshold. The shopkeeper's eyes flickered with interest. The first customer of the day had arrived. Welcome, he said, in a voice that was both warm and unsettling. To curiosities and concoctions, how may I assist you? And so it began. The beauty elixir. The shopkeeper's smile widened slightly as the door creaked open, 
and a gust of cold wind swept through the shop, rustling the papers on the counter. A woman stepped inside, her heels clicking sharply on the wooden floor. She was tall, with a striking face framed by perfect waves of blonde hair. She wore an expensive, form-fitting dress and carried an air of confidence that seemed to precede her like a shadow. She paused, glancing around the dimly lit shop with a mixture of curiosity and disdain. Her manicured fingers tapped impatiently on the strap of her designer handbag. As her eyes adjusted to the gloom, they fell upon the shopkeeper, who stood calmly behind the counter, his grey eyes gleaming beneath the shadow of his hat. You're open then, she stated, more a command than a question. Always, the shopkeeper replied smoothly, his voice a soft, velvety whisper that seemed to fill the room. What brings you to curiosities and concoctions, miss? Mariana, Mariana Dubois, she answered, tilting her head slightly as if she expected him to recognize her name. When he did not, her lips tightened into a faint sneer. I was told about this place by a friend, she continued, her tone dripping with skepticism. She said, you have things, potions, that can help people like me. The shopkeeper's smile never wavered. I have many things here, he said, and all of them can help in one way or another. What exactly do you seek? Mariana hesitated, her gaze flicking nervously around the shop. I need something to make me beautiful, more beautiful than anyone else. My career depends on it, she finally confessed, her voice filled with a mixture of desperation and arrogance. I'm an actress, you see, but lately, well, people are starting to talk. They say I'm not as young as I used to be, not as, um, perfect. The shopkeeper's eyes twinkled with understanding. Ah, uh, I see. You fear the passage of time, the inevitable decay that comes for us all. He mused, his voice taking on a thoughtful tone. And you believe a potion can solve this problem? Mariana's expression hardened. I don't care what it takes. I just want to be the most beautiful woman in the room, forever. The shopkeeper nodded slowly, as if he had heard such a request countless times before. He turned to the large wooden cabinet behind him and opened it, his fingers dancing over the vials within. After a moment, he selected a small, ornate bottle filled with a shimmering, golden liquid. This, he said, holding the vial up to the light is the elixir of beauty. One drop will enhance your natural beauty beyond imagination. Your skin will glow, your hair will shine, and your presence will captivate all who gaze upon you. But I must warn you, Miss Dubois, its effects are potent and must be treated with care. One drop only. Mariana's eyes widened with excitement. I'll take it, she said quickly, reaching for her purse. How much? The shopkeeper's smile remained, but his expression grew serious. The price is not measured in money, Miss Dubois, but in the desire that brought you here. Are you willing to pay the price? Mariana hesitated for only a second. Yes, whatever it takes. The shopkeeper nodded and placed the vial gently in her hand. Remember, he whispered, one drop only. She snatched the vial and turned to leave, barely acknowledging the shopkeeper's warning. As she exited the shop, the door creaked shut behind her with an unsettling finality. Scene, Mariana's apartment. Mariana wasted no time. Back in her lavish apartment, she stood before a large, ornate mirror, the vial of the elixir of beauty held tightly in her hand. She stared at her reflection, her face still undeniably beautiful, but marked by faint lines and a slight tiredness in her eyes that had never been there before. Her hand trembled slightly as she uncorked the vial. One drop, she murmured, mimicking the shopkeeper's words with a sneer, but as the shimmering liquid touched her fingertip, 
Greed overtook her. Why stop at just one drop? She was Mariana Dubois. She deserved it all. With a quick, defiant motion, she tipped the vial back and drank every last drop. For a moment, nothing happened. Then, she felt a tingling sensation spread across her skin, a warmth that quickly turned into an intense, almost euphoric rush. She watched in the mirror as her skin tightened and glowed, her hair became lustrous and thick, and her eyes sparkled with a youthful vitality she had not seen in years. She laughed, delighted by the miraculous transformation, but the warmth did not stop. It intensified, becoming hot, then scorching. Panic flashed across her face as she felt her skin begin to tighten further, far too tight. She gasped, her hands flying to her cheeks, which felt like they were stretching and pulling painfully over her bones. Mariana screamed, watching in horror as her reflection began to change. Her skin was now unnaturally smooth, almost like porcelain, her eyes wide and glassy, her lips frozen in a distorted smile. Her hair, once full and flowing, began to fall in clumps around her feet. She staggered back, but the mirror seemed to draw her in, her own face now a grotesque mask of beauty, a caricature, a nightmare. She reached up to touch her skin, but it cracked under her fingers, pieces flaking off like dried clay. Desperately, she turned away from the mirror, but it was too late. Her body began to seize, her limbs stiffening, her screams grew silent as her mouth froze open in a rictus of terror, her eyes wide and unblinking. She felt her muscles turn rigid, her body becoming harder, colder. In moments, Mariana Dubois was transformed into a lifelike statue of herself, a perfect, horrifying monument to vanity and greed. Back in the shop, the shopkeeper stood behind his counter, calmly closing the large ledger where a new name had just been written, Mariana Dubois. He paused, staring at the name for a moment, then slowly crossed it out with a flourish. He chuckled softly and returned to polishing the mortar and pestle, his grey eyes gleaming with a knowing light. The chime rang softly once more, and the shop door creaked open again. Another customer stepped in, drawn by an unseen force, and the shopkeeper's smile widened. Welcome, he whispered, to curiosities and concoctions. How may I assist you? The love draught. The bell above the door chimed softly as a man stepped inside the potion shop. He was in his mid-thirties, with a slight frame and unkempt hair. His clothes were plain and rumpled, and his eyes darted nervously around the room, as if expecting to find something lurking in the shadows. His hands fidgeted with a worn hat, twisting it anxiously in his grasp. The shopkeeper looked up from his ledger, his grey eyes narrowing with curiosity. He could sense the unease radiating from the man, the scent of desperation that seemed to cling to him like a heavy fog. Good evening, the shopkeeper greeted, with a calm, almost soothing tone. How may I assist you? The man hesitated, swallowing hard before speaking. I... I was told by a friend that you might have something to help me. He stammered, his voice barely above a whisper. The shopkeeper raised an eyebrow. A friend, you say? Interesting. What is it that you seek? The man shuffled his feet, his gaze flitting nervously around the shop. I... I need a potion, he confessed finally. A love potion. There's this woman, Sarah. She doesn't even know I exist. I've tried everything, but she won't give me the time of day. The shopkeeper's expression remained neutral, but his eyes seemed to gleam with a strange light. Ah, unrequited love, he mused softly. A tale as old as time itself. And you believe that a potion could make her love you? The man nodded quickly, his eyes pleading. Yes, I just want her to notice me, to feel the way I feel, just once, to see what I see when I look at her. The shopkeeper leaned back slightly, his fingers steepled before him. And are you prepared for the consequences? 
he asked, his tone carrying a hint of warning. The man frowned. Consequences, he echoed, his voice tinged with impatience. I don't care about consequences. I just want her to love me. A faint smile played at the corners of the shopkeeper's lips. Very well, he replied, turning to the cabinet behind him. He reached inside, his fingers moving with purpose as he selected a small, delicate bottle filled with a deep red liquid that seemed to shimmer in the low light. This is the love draft, the shopkeeper said, placing the vial on the counter between them. A potent concoction that will make the one who drinks it fall deeply in love with the first person they see. But I must caution you, love is a powerful force, and this potion will magnify that emotion beyond your wildest dreams and nightmares. The man's eyes were fixed on the vial, his breath quickening with excitement. I'll take it, he said, reaching for his wallet. How much? The shopkeeper shook his head slowly. The price, as always, is not in money, but in the desire that has brought you here. Are you sure you wish to proceed? The man's hand trembled as he reached out and took the vial. Yes, he whispered, almost to himself. Yes, I'm sure. The shopkeeper watched him for a moment longer, then nodded. One drop, and her heart will be yours, he said softly. But remember, love is not a thing to be taken lightly. The man barely heard the warning as he clutched the vial tightly in his hand and hurried out of the shop, the door slamming shut behind him with an ominous thud. Scene, a cosy cafe. A few days later, the man found himself seated in a small, cosy cafe. Across the room, Sarah sat with a group of friends, laughing and chatting, completely unaware of his presence. His heart pounded in his chest as he watched her, his hand gripping the vial of the love draft hidden in his pocket. He waited until Sarah's friends went to order more drinks, leaving her momentarily alone. He took a deep breath, slipped the vial out of his pocket, and carefully poured a single drop of the red liquid into her coffee cup. The potion dissolved instantly, leaving no trace. He waited, his heart racing as Sarah took a sip. For a moment, nothing happened. Then, her eyes met his from across the room. She blinked, her expression shifting from curiosity to something more intense. A slow smile spread across her lips and she stood up, moving toward him with a sudden, purposeful stride. Hello, she said, her voice soft and warm. I... I've seen you around, haven't I? He felt a surge of triumph. Yes, he replied, trying to keep his voice steady. I'm... I'm Michael. Michael, she repeated, as if savouring the sound of his name. I feel like I've known you forever. At first... Everything was perfect. Sarah was attentive, affectionate, and seemed genuinely infatuated with him. They spent every moment together, and Michael felt a happiness he had never known. But soon, her attention began to feel suffocating. She would call him dozens of times a day, show up at his apartment unannounced, and follow him wherever he went. Her eyes held a manic gleam, and her love became obsessive, almost frantic. One night, Michael awoke to find Sarah standing over his bed, staring down at him with an intensity that sent chills down his spine. Her hair was dishevelled, her eyes wide and unblinking. I love you, Michael, she whispered, her voice unnaturally calm. And I'll never let you go. Fear gripped him. Sarah, you're scaring me, he said, trying to keep his voice steady. She smiled, but it was a smile devoid of warmth. I just want to be close to you. Always. Days turned into a nightmarish blur. No matter where he went, she was there. Her obsession grew darker, more violent. She began leaving threatening messages, accusing him of infidelity, and her behaviour became increasingly erratic. She screamed at him in public, 
her love turning into a terrifying, possessive rage. One night, in a desperate attempt to escape, Michael tried to lock himself in his bathroom, but Sarah forced her way in, her eyes blazing with fury. In a frantic struggle, she lunged at him with a kitchen knife, and in self-defense, Michael pushed her back. She slipped, her head striking the edge of the bathtub with a sickening thud. Michael stared in horror as Sarah's lifeless body crumpled to the floor, her eyes still wide with that haunting, obsessive stare. Days later, Michael thought it was over, but he was wrong. The next night, he heard a soft whisper echoing through his apartment. I love you, Michael. I'll never let you go. He turned, but no one was there. The lights flickered and shadows moved unnaturally along the walls. He could feel her presence, her eyes watching him from the darkness. Sarah's spirit haunted him relentlessly. Her ghostly figure appeared in mirrors. Her laughter echoed in the dead of night and her cold breath brushed against his neck. The more he tried to escape, the more she closed in around him, her love transformed into a nightmarish, unending torment. Driven to madness, Michael tried to flee the city, but no matter where he went, she was there. Her spirit clung to him like a curse, an eternal shadow that he could never escape. He realized too late the price of playing with forces beyond his control, the cost of a love that was never meant to be. The power tonic. The bell above the door jingled with a sharp, metallic sound, cutting through the quiet of the potion shop. A tall, imposing man in his late fifties entered, his tailored suit sharply creased, his shoes polished to a mirror shine. His face was weathered, marked with lines that spoke of both ambition and ruthlessness. His dark eyes darted around the dimly lit shop with a mixture of disdain and curiosity, as if he could hardly believe he had found himself in such a place. The shopkeeper looked up from his ledger, a faint smile touching his lips. Good evening, he said smoothly. Welcome to Curiosities and Concoctions. How may I assist you? The man's eyes narrowed and he took a step forward his gaze fixed intently on the shopkeeper. I was told about this place by someone, someone who said you could help me. He began, his voice commanding, but carrying a note of urgency. The shopkeeper tilted his head slightly, the shadow of his wide-brimmed hat obscuring his expression. Many come here seeking help, mister. Arthur Crane, the man replied, his tone clipped. And I, I'm in need of something very specific. I'm running for re-election and I've encountered some obstacles. I've been a mayor for 15 years. I've ruled this city with strength and conviction. But now... He paused, his jaw tightening. Now they're turning on me. The people, the press, even my own party. They've lost faith and they're starting to see me as the villain. The shopkeeper nodded slowly, his grey eyes flickering with interest. I see, he said softly, and you believe a potion could restore their faith in you? Arthur Crane nodded, his face hardening with determination. I don't just want them to trust me. I want them to worship me, to hang on my every word. I need power, absolute power over them. The shopkeeper's smile widened ever so slightly. Power is a dangerous thing to desire, Mr. Crane. It can be given, but it can also be taken away with interest. I'm not here for a lecture, Crane snapped. I want results. Can you give me what I need or not? The shopkeeper chuckled softly. Very well, he said, turning to the cabinet behind him. He reached for a large, ornate vial filled with a dark, swirling liquid that seemed almost alive, shifting and churning like a storm cloud trapped in glass. This, the shopkeeper said, placing the vial carefully on the counter, is the power tonic. A single drop, and you will possess a presence that none can resist. Your words will become commands. 
your very gaze a force to be reckoned with. But, he added, his voice growing quiet, beware. Power taken by unnatural means has a way of becoming uncontrollable. Arthur Crane snatched the vial from the counter, his eyes gleaming with greed. I've controlled this city for years, he scoffed. I think I can handle a little more power. The shopkeeper bowed his head slightly. As you wish. The price is not in gold or silver, but in your intent. Are you prepared to pay it? Crane's lip curled in a sneer. I'll pay whatever it takes. The shopkeeper's smile faded, and for a moment his eyes seemed to flash with something darker. One drop, Mr. Crane, he whispered. One drop is all it takes. Arthur Crane pocketed the vial and turned sharply, marching out of the shop without a second glance. The door closed behind him with a heavy, final thud. A week later, Arthur Crane stood on a stage before a massive crowd, the vial of power tonic hidden in his pocket. He glanced nervously at his advisers, who watched with scepticism. The press had been brutal in recent weeks, and his popularity had plummeted. His speeches, once compelling, had fallen flat. But tonight, things would change. He took a deep breath, uncorked the vial, and carefully let a single drop of the dark liquid fall onto his tongue. It tasted bitter, like ash and iron, but he felt a warmth spread through his body, a tingling sensation that grew more intense with every passing second. He stepped up to the podium, and as he opened his mouth to speak, he felt an energy coursing through him, filling him with a newfound confidence. The crowd, which had been murmuring restlessly, fell silent. People of this great city, he began, his voice resonating with a power he had never known. I stand before you, not just as your mayor, but as your leader, your protector, your savior. The words seemed to echo, amplified by some unseen force, and the crowd responded immediately, their eyes wide, their expressions rapt. They cheered, louder than he had ever heard before, their faces filled with admiration and awe. He continued, his voice growing stronger, more commanding. With every word, the crowd grew more frenzied, their cheers more deafening. He felt a surge of triumph, a rush of euphoria. He had them in the palm of his hand, but as he spoke, he began to notice something strange. The faces in the crowd seemed to blur, their expressions shifting from admiration to something more unsettling. Their eyes grew wider, their mouths stretching into unnatural smiles. They began to chant his name over and over, their voices growing louder and more fevered until it became a deafening roar. Crane felt a chill run down his spine. He tried to speak to calm them, but his voice came out as a whisper. He cleared his throat, tried again, but the words seemed to vanish into the air. Panic gripped him. As the crowd surged forward, their eyes fixed on him with a fanatical intensity. Crane fled back to his office, slamming the door behind him, his heart pounding. He could still hear the chants outside, growing louder, more insistent. He wiped sweat from his brow and reached for a glass of water his hands trembling, but as he raised the glass to his lips, he noticed his reflection in the window. His eyes, they were darker, almost black, and his skin had taken on a strange greyish hue. He blinked, rubbed his eyes, but the reflection remained unchanged. His office door burst open, and his chief advisor rushed in, his face pale. Arthur, they're, they're waiting for you, he stammered his voice filled with terror. Crane turned slowly, his heart racing. Waiting for me, he repeated. They won't leave, the advisor said. They're chanting. They won't stop. It's like they're possessed. Crane's eyes widened in fear. He moved to the window and looked out. The crowd was still there, chanting his name, their eyes wide, their faces twisted into unnatural smiles. Suddenly, 
he felt a sharp pain in his chest and he doubled over, gasping for breath. His skin burned, his bones felt like they were on fire. He clutched his chest, collapsing to the floor as a wave of agony washed over him. And then he heard it, a voice whispering in his ear, low and sinister. You wanted power, Arthur Crane, and now you have it. He looked up, his vision blurring, and saw a figure standing in the shadows of his office. It was the shopkeeper, his face obscured by his hat, his grey eyes gleaming with an unnatural light. What? What is happening to me? Crane gasped, his voice trembling. The shopkeeper stepped forward, his smile cold and sharp. You wanted power over others, he said softly. But you didn't understand that power comes with a cost. You took from forces beyond your comprehension, and now they will take from you. Crane's eyes widened in terror as he realized the full extent of his mistake. The crowd outside was not just a crowd, it was a gathering, a cult formed by the very power he had sought to wield. And now they were his followers, forever bound to him. He tried to stand, but his legs refused to move. He felt his body stiffening, his muscles locking in place. He reached out, but his hands had turned to stone, his flesh hardening, his veins filling with cold, dark liquid. His screams were swallowed by the sound of the chanting outside, growing louder, more frenzied, as he transformed into a lifeless statue, a monument to his own ambition and greed. Back in the shop, the shopkeeper calmly closed his ledger, another name freshly written and crossed out, Arthur Crane. He turned to the door as the bell chimed once more. A new customer stepped inside, drawn by that familiar, desperate need. Welcome, the shopkeeper said, his voice soft and welcoming, to curiosities and concoctions. How may I assist you? And so the cycle continued, weaving its dark, twisted web. The healing brew, the bell above the door chimed softly, and the door creaked open, letting in a shaft of golden light from the setting sun. A woman stepped inside, glancing around the dimly lit shop with a mix of curiosity and quiet determination. She was in her mid-thirties, with tired eyes and dark hair pulled back in a loose bun. Her face bore the marks of sleepless nights and worry, but there was a calm strength in her demeanour. She wore a simple nurse's uniform, and her hands were slightly calloused, evidence of years spent in service to others. The shopkeeper, standing behind his counter, looked up from his ledger. His grey eyes studied her carefully, and a faint smile touched his lips. Good evening, he said in his usual soft, velvety tone. Welcome to curiosities and concoctions. How may I assist you? The woman hesitated for a moment, then stepped closer to the counter. I'm not sure if I'm in the right place, she began, her voice quiet but steady. A patient, a little girl. She told me about this shop. She said you have things here that can help people. The shopkeeper's smile widened slightly. We do have many things that can help, miss. Rebecca, she replied. Rebecca Turner. I'm a nurse, and I work at the children's hospital down the street. We have a patient, a young boy, Timmy. He's very sick, and the doctors have tried everything, but he's not getting better. The shopkeeper nodded listening intently, his eyes never leaving her face. And you believe that I have something that can help this boy? Rebecca's expression was earnest, almost pleading. I don't know, she admitted, but I've heard stories, strange stories. I don't usually believe in things like this, but I'm desperate. He's so young and he deserves a chance. I'll do anything to help him. The shopkeeper paused, then slowly turned to the cabinet behind him. There is something, he said softly. A potion that could cure any illness, no matter how grave. But, he added, glancing back at her, its effects depend entirely 
on the intentions of the one who uses it. Are you certain that your purpose is pure? Rebecca's eyes filled with tears, but she nodded firmly. I just want to help him, she whispered. He's a child. He hasn't had a chance to live yet. The shopkeeper reached into the cabinet and carefully selected a small, delicate vial filled with a clear, shimmering liquid that seemed to glow faintly in the dim light. He placed it gently on the counter between them. This is the healing brew, he said. A single drop will bring healing, but only if used with a pure heart and a selfless intent. I must warn you, however, any deviation from that path, any selfish desire, and its effects will turn unpredictable. Rebecca picked up the vial, cradling it in her hands as if it were the most precious thing in the world. Thank you, she said, her voice thick with emotion. I promise, I'll use it for good. The shopkeeper inclined his head slightly. I believe you, he murmured, but remember, the outcome is in your hands. Rebecca nodded and turned to leave, the vial clutched tightly in her hand. The door closed behind her with a gentle click and the shop fell silent once more. Rebecca hurried back to the hospital, her heart racing with a mixture of hope and fear. She entered Timmy's room quietly, careful not to disturb him. The boy lay on the bed, pale and frail, his breathing shallow and laboured. Machines beeped softly around him, their sounds a constant reminder of his fragile state. Rebecca glanced at the vial in her hand, then at Timmy. She hesitated for a moment, fear gripping her. What if it didn't work? What if the shopkeeper was just a charlatan or worse? But then she looked into Timmy's innocent face and she felt a surge of determination. She opened the vial and carefully let a single drop fall onto Timmy's lips. For a moment, nothing happened. The room remained quiet. The machines continued their monotonous beeping and Rebecca's heart sank. But then Timmy's eyes fluttered open and he took a deep, steady breath. His colour began to return and the pallor that had clung to his skin seemed to fade. He blinked, looking around the room and then smiled up at Rebecca, his eyes bright and clear. Hi, Nurse Rebecca, he whispered, his voice stronger than it had been in days. Tears welled up in Rebecca's eyes and she laughed, relief flooding her. Hi, Timmy, she replied, her voice trembling. How do you feel? Better, Timmy said with a grin. Much better. Rebecca glanced at the monitors. The readings had stabilized. The signs of the disease seemed to have disappeared. She felt a wave of gratitude, a warm glow spreading through her chest. The potion had worked, but as she turned to leave the room, she noticed something strange. The air seemed to shimmer around her, and for a brief moment, she thought she saw the faint outline of a figure. A woman, dressed in an old-fashioned gown, standing by Timmy's bedside, her expression serene and gentle. Rebecca blinked, and the figure vanished. She shook her head, dismissing it as a trick of the light and hurried out of the room. That night, Rebecca sat in her small apartment, holding the empty vial in her hand. She felt a sense of peace she hadn't felt in years. She had done something good, something that truly mattered, but a small voice nagged at the back of her mind, a question she couldn't quite shake. What was that figure she had seen? Was it real, or just her imagination? As she pondered, a soft knock sounded at her door. She stood, puzzled, and opened it. There stood the shopkeeper, his hat casting shadows over his face, his grey eyes twinkling with something unreadable. Good evening, Miss Turner, he said politely. I see the potion served its purpose. Rebecca frowned, surprised. How, how did you know? The shopkeeper chuckled softly. I know many things, he replied. I simply wanted to ensure that you used it wisely. And it seems you have. 
Rebecca felt a shiver run down her spine. Why did you help me? She asked cautiously. Why do you do what you do? The shopkeeper's smile grew faint. I provide opportunities, he said slowly. A chance for people to choose, to show what is truly in their hearts. You, Miss Turner, chose well. Rebecca looked at him, searching his face for answers, but found only mystery. Will there be consequences? She asked quietly. The shopkeeper tilted his head slightly, considering her question. For you? No. But remember, Miss Turner, the power of the potions lies not in the liquid, but in the intention behind it. You have used it for good, and for that, there is always a reward. He turned to leave, but paused at the door. Take care, Rebecca, he said softly. And remember, the choices we make define us more than we know. With that, he disappeared into the night, leaving Rebecca standing in her doorway, the empty vial still in her hand. She felt a sense of calm, a peace that seemed to settle deep in her soul. She had chosen well, and perhaps in some way, she had passed a test she never even knew she was taking. Back in the shop, the shopkeeper closed his ledger, his expression thoughtful. He looked up as the door opened once more and a figure stepped inside, drawn by the same unseen force that had brought all the others. Welcome, the shopkeeper said, his voice as soft and inviting as ever, to curiosities and concoctions. How may I assist you? The cycle continued, the choices waiting to be made, each one revealing a new truth, a new path, a new destiny. The potions were not good or evil, they were mirrors, reflecting the hearts of those who dared to seek their power, and as long as the door remained open, the shopkeeper would be there, waiting, watching, and smiling. Ah, 3 a.m., the witching hour, a time when the veil between worlds is thin, when the night holds its breath, and something calls to you. Some say those who wake at this time are being watched, that something out there is stirring, reaching into your dreams. Perhaps it's a warning, or maybe it's an invitation. Whatever the reason, you've woken up at just the right time, and now, my dear shadow dwellers, it's time for a story, a tale just for you. Tonight's journey takes us to the edge of reality, where shadows and spirits Luck in hunger, so sit back and listen carefully, because if you're hearing my voice, you're already a part of the tale. The broadcast. Crystal woke with a start, her breath quick and shallow. Her bedroom was cloaked in darkness, and the silence pressed in on her, thick and oppressive. She rubbed her eyes and glanced at the clock on the nightstand. The red digits glowed unnervingly bright. 3 a.m. An uneasy chill crept up her spine, and no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't shake the strange feeling that gnawed at her. There was something about the dead of night, something about 3 a.m., that made her feel as though the world was a little less solid, as if the veil between reality and something else was dangerously thin. Sleep wouldn't come. Not tonight. Crystal slipped out of bed, the cold wooden floor biting at her bare feet. She wandered downstairs to the kitchen, her mind restless. 
The old radio sitting on the counter caught her attention. Maybe some soft music would help ease her nerves. She flipped it on. Static crackled through the speakers, the harsh sound filling the kitchen with an eerie hum. She turned the dial, searching for something familiar, but the static remained. Just as she was about to give up, the static faded, replaced by a smooth, velvety voice. Good evening, night dwellers, the voice purred. You've tuned in at just the right time. Tonight's story is for someone very special. Someone who may already be listening. This is the tale of Crystal. Her blood ran cold. Her name. The voice on the radio was speaking directly to her. She swallowed hard, her fingers tightening on the counter. But she couldn't bring herself to turn the radio off. The voice was calm, yet unnerving, as though it knew far more than it should. As Crystal stood there, the world around her began to shift. The voice faded, and her mind was pulled elsewhere, back to the moments that led her here. Crystal's days had been blending together for some time now. Everything felt strangely distant, as though she were living in a memory she hadn't quite learned yet. At work, she smiled at her colleagues, went through the motions, but the sense of wrongness never left her. It was as though something was watching her, something she couldn't see but could always feel, lurking just behind her. Then, the images started. It began innocuously enough, just a quick snap of her coffee cup one morning, a simple photo she took without thinking. But when she glanced at the photo later, she noticed something in the corner, a shadow, faint and distorted, almost like a smudge, she dismissed it at first, but the more she looked, the more unsettling it became. It wasn't just a shadow, it was a face. A twisted, gaunt face that seemed to leer at her from the background. Over the next few days, it grew worse. Every time she took a picture, whether it was of her desk, her friends, or even herself, there it was, the face, clearer with each shot, old decaying eyes hollowed out, as though it were leeching off her, as if, with each photo, the spirit in the images was getting closer, feeding on her energy. At night, she began to hear whispers, faint and distant, calling her name. They seemed to come from every corner of the room, growing louder as the hours passed. And then came the message. One evening, as she scrolled through her phone, a text appeared on her screen. Help me. I'm trapped. The number was unknown. Her heart raced, and she stared at the message for what felt like an eternity. Who had sent it? She tried to ignore it, but the words echoed in her mind. Help me. I'm trapped. The whispers became unbearable. Everywhere she went, she felt the pull of something unnatural. Desperate for answers, Crystal turned to an old Ouija board she found buried in her attic, convinced it was her only way to communicate with whatever was haunting her. It was late. The air in her living room was thick, the dim glow of candles casting flickering shadows on the walls. The Ouija board sat before her, the planchette resting under her trembling fingers. "'Is anyone there?' she whispered, barely able to hear her own voice. The planchette remained still for a moment, then slowly began to move. Crystal's heart hammered in her chest as the board spelled out, Yes. What do you want? she asked, her throat dry. Help. Her skin prickled. Who are you? Trapped. The planchette paused, then continued to move. Crystal's eyes darted to the large mirror hanging on the wall across the room. Her reflection stared back at her, but something else was there too. A figure, barely visible, hovered just behind her, a gaunt face, hollow eyes, and a smile that stretched too wide. The spirit reached out, its hand pressing against the glass from the other side. Help me, it whispered, its voice thin and desperate, echoing inside her head. I've been trapped for so long. Please, set me free. Fear gripped her, but something inside her softened. The spirit looked so broken, so sad. She couldn't just leave it there. How? she whispered. The spirit's smile widened. 
a sacrifice. It said softly, its voice almost gentle. Crystal's heart stopped. What kind of sacrifice? The spirit's eyes gleamed. Yours? No, she cried, backing away from the board. I won't do it. A sudden screech from outside pierced the air, the sound of tyres skidding on asphalt, followed by the agonised yowl of a cat. Crystal gasped and turned back to the mirror. The spirit's once pleading face twisted into something monstrous. Its eyes blazed with malice, its grin now sharp and hungry. It laughed, a chilling hollow sound that echoed through the room. <laughs> Before Crystal could react, the mirror shimmered and the spirit's hand shot out, grabbing her wrist with an iron grip. Her scream was cut short as she was yanked toward the glass, her body stretching unnaturally as she was pulled inside. The last thing she saw was her own reflection, twisted in horror as she slammed against the inside of the mirror. The spirit stepped out into the real world, free at last, leaving her trapped behind the glass, her hands pounding against the cold surface. Crystal's eyes snapped open. She was still in her bed, her heart racing. But something was wrong. The world outside the mirror was distorted, blurry. She reached out, but her fingers met smooth, cold glass. She was inside the mirror. She screamed, banging her fists against the glass but no one could hear her. The radio on the nightstand clicked off, leaving nothing but an ominous silence. The clock blinked. 3.01 a.m. The broadcast was over. Shelley's story. The radio sat untouched in Crystal's now empty house, surrounded by dust and shadows. The once familiar broadcast of eerie tales was replaced with nothing but static, a harsh grating sound that filled the silence like a broken memory. The air felt heavier, as if the house itself remembered Crystal's fate. Across town, Shelley stirred awake in her bed. Her eyes flicked to the clock, the glowing digits reading 3 a.m. She sighed, unable to drift back to sleep. The night stretched long and still, a quiet discomfort tugging at her. Deciding that some soft music might help, she slipped out of bed and made her way to the living room. She flipped on the radio expecting the soothing sounds of a late-night playlist. But instead of music, there was static. Confused, she adjusted the dial, trying to find a clear station. Then, the static faded, replaced by the deep, familiar voice of the strange radio host. Good evening, night dwellers, the voice intoned. Tonight's story is for someone very special. Someone who doesn't believe in the darkness that lurks just out of sight. This story is about Shelley. Shelley froze. Her name echoed through the speakers, the sound almost mocking. She shook her head in disbelief, but found herself drawn in, curiosity outweighing her unease. As the voice faded, the world around her shifted. Shelley found herself sitting on a plush couch with her friends, popcorn in hand, as they watched a campy old vampire movie. The exaggerated fangs, capes and over-the-top acting had them all laughing. Vampires, please, no such thing, Shelley said, tossing a handful of popcorn at the screen with a chuckle. Her friends laughed along with her, except for one. Cassie, her closest friend, gave her an odd look, her eyes narrowing ever so slightly. Don't be so sure, Shelley she said with a smirk that seemed more than playful. Shelley waved her off. Come on, Cassie, we all know vampires are just legends. It's all make-believe. Cassie didn't respond, her expression unreadable. The conversation moved on, and soon enough, the movie ended. But that look lingered in Shelley's mind, though she quickly shrugged it off. A few days later, Cassie showed up at Shelley's door, looking unusually serious. She insisted they talk. Over coffee, Cassie leaned in, her voice low, almost conspiratorial. Shelley, I need to tell you something. Vampires, they're real. Shelley stared at her, trying to suppress a laugh. Oh, come on, you can't be serious. Cassie's eyes were steady, her tone unwavering. I am serious. They exist, and I can prove it. Shelley shook her head, chuckling. 
You've been watching too many movies, Cassie. But Cassie didn't laugh. Her face remained solemn, and after a moment of silence, she sighed. You'll see. That evening, after Cassie had left, Shelley paced around her apartment, still laughing to herself about the ridiculous conversation. Vampires, really? She muttered under her breath. Cassie's lost it. But the next morning, Cassie called again, this time with an air of excitement. Hey Shelley, I've got something special for you. I scored a ticket to a very exclusive event, a VIP dinner and party. You won't believe how hard it is to get in, but I've got a spare ticket for you. Shelley's curiosity was piqued. A party for the rich and famous? That sounded like a dream. Wow, Cassie, that sounds amazing. Count me in. That evening, the two friends travelled in style. The venue was lavish. A sprawling mansion nestled deep in the countryside, far from the city's lights. Shelley marvelled at the opulence, her eyes wide as she took in the grandeur of the place. The guests were dressed in elegant gowns and sharp suits, each one more glamorous than the last. Shelley felt like she was in a dream, mingling with what she assumed were celebrities and the elite. As the evening wore on, Shelley found herself swept up in the excitement, chatting with other guests and enjoying the luxurious atmosphere. The food was rich, the wine flowing endlessly, and she felt a rare sense of privilege. It was a night to remember. Then the lights dimmed and a hush fell over the crowd. A tall, imposing man in a tailored suit stepped onto the stage at the front of the grand room, holding a glass of red wine. Ladies and gentlemen, he announced, his voice commanding, tonight we have the honour of welcoming a new member to our special circle. Shelley, would you come forward? The crowd turned to face her, and Shelley, beaming with excitement, made her way to the front. She grinned, thinking she was about to be welcomed into some elite society, maybe even make a name for herself among the powerful. The man's smile widened as he looked her up and down. Tell me, Shelley, when did you turn? Shelley blinked, confused. Turn? What do you mean? The man frowned, reaching out to grab her arm. He held it for a moment, feeling her warm skin. His eyes narrowed, and a murmur spread through the room. She's warm, he said, his voice laced with disbelief. She's not one of us. Shelley's smile faltered, her heart beginning to race. I don't understand. Cassie's laughter echoed from behind her. Shelley turned, horrified, as her friend stepped forward, a wicked grin spreading across her face. Cassie opened her mouth, revealing long, gleaming fangs. Oh, Shelley, Cassie said, her voice dripping with mockery. You didn't believe in vampires, but you should have. The room seemed to close in on her as the realisation hit. Every guest in the room was a vampire, and she was the only human. Shelley stumbled backward, but the crowd closed in around her, their eyes gleaming with hunger. Back at Shelley's house, the radio crackled with static. The voice of the host had long since faded, leaving only the eerie sound of the dead air filling the empty room. Kathy's story. The radio in Shelley's house crackled with static, a faint hum of lost voices weaving through the air. In another part of town, Kathy stirred in her bed, unable to shake the feeling that something was wrong. She rolled over, glancing at the clock on her bedside table, 3 a.m. A sense of unease crept over her as she sat up, rubbing her eyes. Sleep wasn't coming back, and the quiet of the house pressed down on her like a weight. Needing something to distract herself, Kathy headed downstairs, flipping on the small radio in the kitchen. She fiddled with the dial, hoping for some soft music to break the silence. But instead of music, the static returned, followed by the now familiar voice of the mysterious host. Welcome back, dear listeners. Tonight, our tale is about someone very special, someone whose life is about to change forever. This story is about Kathy. Her heart skipped a beat. Kathy leaned closer to the radio, her fingers tightening around the dial. The voice felt like it was speaking directly to her, 
just like the stories she had heard about before. Before she could turn it off, her surroundings faded away, and she found herself drawn into the story. Kathy sat at her desk, lost in her work. The office buzzed with the low hum of typing and phone calls, but her mind wandered. A new employee had started at the company recently, a woman named Elise, and she had quickly caught Kathy's attention. There was something peculiar about her, but also something intriguing. Kathy had struck up a conversation with her during lunch, and they had become fast friends. Elise was quirky, obsessed with cats, which Kathy found endearing. Every time they walked past one on the street, Elise seemed to communicate with it, whispering to it as if they shared some secret language. Cats flocked to her, as though drawn by an invisible force. Kathy thought it was sweet at first, charming even, though it left her slightly unsettled. As the weeks passed, their friendship deepened, and they spent more time together. But strange things began happening when Kathy was alone. She heard noises in her apartment, scratching at the windows, soft padding sounds in the hallways. At night, shadows flitted in the corners of her vision, always moving, always watching. One cold, moonless night, Kathy left work late. The street was eerily quiet, the air thick with fog that clung to the ground like mist. As she walked through the dimly lit streets, a strange sensation washed over her. She felt eyes on her, sharp, predatory. Then she saw it. A large shadow moved just outside the reach of the streetlights, slinking along the edge of the darkness. Kathy's breath hitched in her throat. It looked like the silhouette of a cat, but much larger, too large. It stalked her, its movements unnervingly graceful, like a predator waiting for the right moment to strike. She quickened her pace, heart pounding in her chest, but the shadow followed, never strained too far behind. Her hands trembled as she fumbled with her keys at the door of her apartment, the feeling of being hunted settling deep in her bones. The next morning, Kathy confided in Elise, telling her about the cat-like shadow that had followed her. Elise smiled, but there was something in her eyes that Kathy couldn't read. Cats wouldn't hurt anyone, she said softly, her voice carrying an edge of something darker, unless they had to. The cryptic comment left Kathy uneasy, but she brushed it off, trying to convince herself that she was just imagining things. Elise was her friend, after all. There was no reason to be afraid. One evening, Kathy and Elise went out for drinks, chatting and laughing like they always did. But as they strolled down the street afterward, something changed. Elise grew agitated, her eyes darting back and forth, as if searching for something. Suddenly, Elise rushed across the street, her gaze fixed on a cat, lying still on the pavement, its body limp and lifeless from a recent car accident. Kathy watched in horror as Elise knelt beside it, and without hesitation, began licking the blood from the animal's fur, her tongue curling over the matted hair. What? What are you doing? Kathy stammered, frozen in place. Elise looked up, her eyes gleaming with something primal, something inhuman. Then, without a word, she bolted into the night, leaving Kathy standing alone, her mind reeling. Weeks passed without any word from Elise. Kathy tried calling, texting, but her messages went unanswered. The unease she felt deepened, but she couldn't shake the need to find out what had happened. Then one night, a message finally appeared on her phone. Meet me at the old woods. Midnight. I need to tell you something. Despite her better judgment, Kathy went. The old woods were a dark, tangled mass of trees just outside town, known for their eerie atmosphere. Kathy arrived at the stroke of midnight, her breath misting in the cold air. Elise was waiting for her, standing in the clearing, her expression unreadable. You came, she said her voice carrying an edge of something Kathy couldn't quite place. Before Kathy could respond, figures emerged from the shadows, hooded and cloaked, their movements silent and deliberate. They surrounded her, forming a circle. Kathy's heart raced. What is this? she demanded, backing up as the figures began to chant in a low, guttural hum. Elise stepped forward, 
her face contorted into a cold smile. Lunch! Kathy's eyes widened in horror as the figures pulled back their hoods, revealing faces that were not human. The heads of cats, with gleaming eyes and sharp teeth, stared back at her. They were cat people, grotesque hybrids of humans and felines, their fur bristling in the cold night air. Elise's body shifted, her form twisting and stretching until she stood before Kathy as a massive black cat. Her eyes gleamed with hunger, and a low growl rumbled from her throat. The chanting grew louder, echoing through the woods, and Kathy's scream pierced the night as the cat people closed in on her. Back at Kathy's house, the radio crackled with static, filling the room with its unsettling hum. The voice of the radio host was gone, leaving only the faint, eerie whisper of something ancient and hungry. John's story, the radio in Kathy's house, hissed with static, filling the room with an eerie silence once more. As the static faded, elsewhere in the quiet countryside, John's eyes flickered open. He glanced at the clock beside his bed. 3 a.m. Restlessness gnawed at him, the room feeling heavier than usual, as if something unseen lingered just beyond the walls. Unable to sleep, he slipped out of bed and made his way downstairs. The old radio on the kitchen counter caught his eye, and without thinking, he turned it on. Static buzzed from the speakers, but soon the crackling sound gave way to a familiar, chilling voice. Good evening, Night Wanderers. Tonight's tale is one of loyalty, love, and betrayal. A story about a man named John. John's hand tightened on the dial, his name spoken by the mysterious voice. A shiver ran down his spine. He listened, unable to turn away as the voice began to tell the story. Slowly, his surroundings shifted and his mind was pulled into the tale. It was John's wedding day. The sun had set and the reception was winding down. He sat with his new bride, her hand in his, a glass of wine in the other. He was filled with joy, the kind of happiness that seemed boundless. I'm so happy, he said to her, his heart full. She smiled, her eyes gleaming in the dim light. So am I. After the party ended, they said their goodbyes and climbed into the car. She drove them deep into the countryside, far from the city lights, to a small cottage they had recently purchased. It was a beautiful, secluded place, perfect for their new life together. As they neared the cottage, she turned to him and said, our pack will be so happy here. John raised an eyebrow. Pack? Our family, of course, she replied with a laugh, brushing it off. But the way she said it lingered in his mind, like a forgotten memory trying to resurface. Weeks passed. The honeymoon glow had faded, and something unsettling began to grow within John. He noticed strange things. Dark shapes moving outside in the shadowy fields beyond the cottage. Sometimes he heard the distant howls of wolves, though he knew wolves didn't roam these parts. Every night, the same sounds would echo through the woods, too close for comfort. His wife dismissed his concerns. You're just imagining things, she said, smiling sweetly. Wolves haven't been in this area for years. But John couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. He swore he saw a man wandering near the edge of the property late at night, lurking just out of sight. Each time he brought it up, his wife assured him it was nothing more than reflections or shadows. Months passed, and the strange occurrences became more frequent. John often found himself awake at odd hours, staring out the window into the darkness, waiting to see the figure again. And then one night, his wife told him she was pregnant. He was overjoyed. That's amazing, he exclaimed, pulling her into his arms. Our pack will finally arrive, she whispered, her words sending a shiver down his spine. Thank you, John, for helping us grow stronger. The night of the birth came quickly. His wife insisted on staying at the cottage to deliver the baby, refusing to go to the hospital. John tried to protest, but she wouldn't hear it. She seemed calm, almost eerily so, as she prepared herself for what was to come. When the time came, John did his best to help. 
The labour was fast, almost unnatural. Before he knew it, two newborns were placed in his arms, twins, but as he looked at them, his joy turned to horror. The babies were covered in fur. Their tiny bodies were hunched, with unnaturally long teeth that gleamed in the low light. John gasped, backing away in shock. What? What is this? He stammered, his heart racing. His wife sat up, her smile twisted, her eyes glowing in the darkness. Our pack, she said simply. Suddenly, the door to the cottage burst open with a loud crash. A man, tall, wild-eyed, stepped inside. John's blood ran cold. It was the same man he had seen lurking outside for months. John's wife smiled warmly at the man. Daddy's home, she said. The man grinned, his lips pulling back to reveal sharp, gleaming fangs, his eyes locked onto John, cold and calculating. You've done your part, John, the man said, his voice low and guttural. But you are not one of us. You're not part of our pack. Before John could react, the man's body began to contort and twist, bones cracking and elongating. His face stretched into a snout, his teeth growing longer and more vicious. Fur sprouted from his skin as he shifted into a terrifying werewolf, towering over John. John's wife stood by, cradling the furry, monstrous newborns, watching with satisfaction as the werewolf lunged at her husband. John's scream filled the small cottage, echoing into the night. The scene shifted back to John's house. The radio on his kitchen counter sputtered with static, the voice of the host gone, leaving only the unsettling crackle of dead air. The story was over. The final broadcast. The dim light from the ancient radio station flickered weakly, casting long shadows across the room. Dust swirled in the air, disturbed by the faint breeze that seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere all at once. The equipment was old. Antiquated knobs, dials and switches cluttered the console, their metallic surfaces worn down by years of use. An aged hand, gnarled and weathered with time, reached out from the darkness, its fingers trembling ever so slightly as they hovered over the dials. The skin was thin, almost translucent, the veins beneath pulsing faintly with an otherworldly glow. Slowly, with deliberate care, the hand turned the final dial, the static that filled the room quieting into silence. The old microphone crackled faintly, but the voice that followed was smooth, calm, and rich with the weight of centuries. That concludes tonight's broadcast, the voice murmured, dripping with satisfaction. Our dear listeners have heard their tales, and for those who weren't listening, they will soon, until tomorrow, my night dwellers. With a slow, almost ceremonial movement, the hand reached for the end broadcast button. As it pressed down, a soft click echoed through the room. Suddenly, the entire radio station began to change. The walls, once solid and cluttered with wires and old posters, began to melt away, dissolving into thick, swirling shadows. The console flickered, its metal frame turning to mist, leaving nothing but an empty dark void where the equipment once stood. Fog rolled in from every corner, enveloping the room in a dense cold haze. The floor itself seemed to evaporate, leaving behind a vast emptiness beneath. The entire station was dissolving into something far less real, far less tangible, as if it had never truly existed. The voice, still calm, spoke one last time, its tone filled with quiet amusement. For all those waking in the night, don't forget to tune in. Tomorrow, at 3am, we'll be waiting. The fog swirled and thickened, until everything, station, equipment, and the presence behind the voice, vanished into the night. Only the silence remained, heavy and foreboding, as the world turned back to darkness, ready to greet the next unsuspecting listener. And somewhere, out there in the night, another clock ticked toward 3am.
the invitation. The limousine rolled to a halt on the gravel path, its engine purring like a beast waiting to be unleashed. One by one, four individuals stepped out into the misty night, their shoes crunching on the stone path leading up to the mansion's foreboding iron gates. The gates creaked shut behind them, sealing them into a world they knew nothing about. The mansion loomed ahead, draped in shadow, an ivy that twisted like gnarled fingers up its walls. Every window was dark, offering no glimpse of what lay inside. The air smelled of damp earth and decay, a hint of rot lurking just beneath the surface of civility. Inside, the dining room was all luxury, a sharp contrast to the eerie exterior. A long, polished table stretched out before the guests, five seats arranged with precision. Four were already filled by the bewildered attendees, each one exchanging furtive glances, their nerves barely masked by forced smiles. This place, one of them murmured, it feels off, doesn't it? Another guest, a tall woman, shivered slightly, though the room was warm. Did anyone say why we're here? They didn't need to wait long for an answer. The heavy wooden doors at the far end of the rooms creaked open, and in walked the host, tall, gaunt, with an unsettling smile that never quite reached his hollow eyes. He moved like a shadow, slipping into place. His voice, smooth as silk, but colder than the grave, echoed across the room. Welcome, my honoured guests. You have been selected for something truly special. A prize, if you will. A chance to share, to reveal the very essence of who you are. He gestured toward the table. There are five seats. Four for you, my dear guests, and one for myself, the humble host of tonight's event. The guests shifted uncomfortably, but curiosity outweighed their fear. They sat, each one sipping from their wine glasses, though the taste had begun to sour. The host's eyes gleamed as he spoke again. Now, shall we begin? Our first guest... Mr. Harris, he said, turning toward the man at the far end of the table. Harris, a large, gruff man, straightened in his chair. His eyes darted around nervously, and a bead of sweat trickled down the side of his face. Mr. Harris, let us recount your legacy. Story one, the swamp man. The room darkened, the walls seemed to disappear, and the guests were no longer in the mansion. The dining table, the chairs, the host, all faded away into the shadows. In their place, a night sky flickered above a desolate, fog-covered swamp. The sound of croaking frogs and the distant hum of insects filled the air as the story unfolded like a dream or a nightmare. Harris was a man with no conscience. He took what he wanted, money, belongings, even the last shreds of dignity from those who crossed his path. His words were always cold, sharp as a dagger, and he'd often sneer, Everyone comes from the swamp, as if the world and the people in it were as filthy as the muck he rose from. On a dark, storm-riddled night, Harris was driving home after his latest exploit, robbing an old neighbour of the last money they had to survive the winter. The storm raged overhead, the wind howling through the trees as rain battered his windshield. The tyres screeched against the slick road, and before Harris could react, his car skidded off the road, crashing into the swamp. The last thing he remembered was the cold water swallowing him whole. For weeks, the police searched the area. They found his car, half buried in the mud, but there was no sign of Harris. People whispered about his disappearance, but few cared. He had no friends, no family, only enemies and debts left in his wake. The swamp, it seemed, had claimed him like so many others before, but Harris was not dead. Months passed, and beneath the murky, still waters of the swamp, something stirred. Deep below, buried in the thick mud, Harris opened his eyes. The weight of the swamp pressed down on him, cold and suffocating. His lungs burned, 
but somehow he did not drown. His body, bloated and decayed, began to rise to the surface, drawn by some dark, unnatural force. The moon was full the night Harris emerged. His head broke the surface, then his shoulders, his arms. The water slid off his withered frame, thick with moss and slime. His skin, once pale and coarse, had become a grotesque mixture of rot and plant life. Moss clung to him, and his flesh, sickly green and grey, peeled like dead bark from a tree. Hollow eyes stared out from a face that was barely human. He stumbled onto the road, water dripping from his limbs. In the distance, headlights glowed through the mist. A car idled by the side of the road, its engine still running. Help, Harris croaked, his voice low and cracked like dried leaves underfoot. He approached the car, waving weakly for assistance. But the moment the driver saw him, their face twisted in horror. They slammed the car into gear, tires screeching as they sped away into the night. Harris was left alone, his mind clouded with confusion and growing terror. As he walked toward town, the world seemed to recoil from him. The animals fled, rabbits darting into the underbrush, birds taking flight in panic. The air grew colder with each step, the night darker. At the edge of town, Harris spotted a couple walking under the dim glow of streetlights. His heart quickened. He reached out to them, desperate now. Please help me, he cried, but his voice was more of a rasp, like wind through dry reeds. The couple turned, their faces frozen in terror. They screamed and bolted, vanishing into the night without a second thought. Harris stumbled forward, his steps growing heavier, his legs feeling less and less his own. Finally, he arrived at what had once been his home. The front door was different, freshly painted, the garden tended. He knocked the sound echoing like a death knell in the silent night. When the door opened, a woman stood there, but she was not the one Harris remembered. She took one look at him and shrieked, slamming the door so hard it rattled the windows. Harris, frantic, ran around to the back. Maybe she would listen if she saw him again. He didn't know what was happening, but he needed help. As he approached the back window, he caught his reflection in the glass, and the truth hit him like a punch to the gut. The figure staring back was no longer a man. His eyes were sunken, skin sloughing off in places, his body twisted and overgrown with moss and vines, his mouth gaping in eternal horror. He stumbled backward, gasping, his mind screaming in denial. The back door swung open. The woman stood behind a man holding a shotgun. There it is, she screamed. The monster! Harris raised his hands in surrender, pleading, but his words were lost in the rasp of his decayed throat. Please! The man didn't hesitate. The shotgun roared, and Harris felt the impact tear through him, sending him crumpling to the ground. Back to the diner. The scene snapped back to the dining room. The guests sat in stunned silence, the tension thick enough to choke on. Harris sat at the end of the table, his face pale, his hand trembling as it gripped his wine glass. The host, unbothered, smiled darkly. Quite the prize, isn't it? Harris opened his mouth to speak, but no words came out. He simply stared ahead, haunted by the horror of his own story. The other guests exchanged nervous glances, unsure of what awaited them next. The host raised his glass, his eyes glinting with malice. And now, my dear friends, shall we hear from the next guest? The atmosphere in the dining room is heavy with tension as the first story concludes. Harris, pale and shaken, sits rigidly in his chair, unable to look anyone in the eye. The other guests fidget nervously, glancing between each other and the host, who stands at the head of the table, his ever-present grin unsettling in the flickering candlelight. The host raises an eyebrow, turning his gaze toward the next guest, a woman draped entirely in black, her dark eyes cold and calculating. And now, it is time to hear from you, the host says smoothly, his voice oozing with dark anticipation. You have quite a fascinating story, don't you? The woman 
shifts in her chair, but remains silent, her expression hard as stone. The room begins to darken again, the walls fade in, the table dissolving into shadow, until the guests find themselves no longer in the mansion, but drawn deep into her life. Story 2. The Cat Lady The scene unfolds inside a dimly lit house, cluttered with old furniture and strewn with discarded belongings. But one thing stands out. Cats. They are everywhere. Perched on window sills, lying atop bookshelves, weaving between the legs of chairs and slinking through every corner. The house smells of musty fur and cat food, and the sound of their constant meowing fills the air like a discordant chorus. The woman moves through the house with purpose, her lips twisted in a satisfied smirk as she pets one of the sleek black cats that rubs against her leg. I don't need people, she mutters, scratching the cat under its chin. Cats are better than any human, loyal, loving, deserving. People, nothing but scroungers, beggars. She stands by the window, peering out at the street below, watching the world go by with disdain. Whenever someone knocks at her door, seeking charity or a bit of help, she turns them away without a second thought, her heart hardened over the years. Her family? She had long since dismissed them, refusing to entertain their calls or letters. They'll get nothing from me. When I'm gone, every penny, every scrap of this house will go to my precious cats. They deserve it more than any of those leeches. One afternoon, on her way back from the pet store, her cart loaded with bags of cat food, she strides through the crowded marketplace. She barely notices the old woman in her path, selling small bundles of lavender wrapped in silver foil. Buy some lavender, dearie? The old woman asks kindly, holding out a small bouquet. The woman in black scoffs, brushing her aside. Out of my way, you old hag! As she barges past, the old woman stumbles and falls to the ground, her flowers scattering across the cobblestones. Oh, please, the gypsy woman pleads from the ground. Just a small favour for a little lavender. The woman glares down at her, lips curling in disgust. I have no time for you or your stupid flowers. My cats are hungry. She crushes one of the fallen lavender bundles under her heel and marches off without another word. Behind her, the old gypsy woman mumbles something under her breath, her voice low and filled with an ancient bitterness. You like cats so much, the old woman whispers. Then a cat you shall be. I curse you to walk the world as one of them until you learn what it means to be alone. The woman, of course, hears nothing, too wrapped in her own selfishness to care. Days pass. One night, she wakes suddenly, her room shrouded in darkness. Something feels wrong, though she can't quite place it at first. She sits up, blinking at the strangeness of the world around her. Everything seems... larger. The bed, the room, the very walls of her house loom around her, towering like cliffs. Confusion sweeps over her, and she leaps from the bed, only to land on four paws. Her heart races as she scrambles to the mirror, what she sees makes her blood run cold. Staring back at her is not the woman she once was, but a sleek black cat, her own eyes wide with terror. She spins in circles, trying to shake off the impossible reality, but it's no use. Her form is that of a cat, cursed, just as the gypsy had whispered. Suddenly, she hears a low growl. Turning, she sees her beloved cats, once her companions, her cherished pets, hissing and snarling at her, their fur bristles, their claws unsheathe, and their eyes glow with a feral intensity. They no longer see her as their caretaker. Now, she's just another creature in their territory. The cats lunge at her, scratching and biting with wild ferocity. She screeches in pain and terror, racing through the house, trying to escape the relentless onslaught. Desperately, she spots an open window and leaps through it, narrowly avoiding their claws. She lands with a thud in the neighbor's yard. Disoriented, 
She scrambles to her feet, her tiny heart pounding in her chest. The world is unfamiliar, vast and overwhelming. Panic rises within her as she tries to make sense of what has happened. But before she can catch her breath, a deep, menacing growl echoes from the shadows. She turns, her eyes widening in horror as she sees them. Two massive Rottweilers, the neighbor's dogs she had always complained about. They stand there, teeth bared, their eyes fixed on her with deadly intent. The realization comes too late. She is no longer the woman with control over her life. She is prey, and before she can even think to run, the dogs pounce. Back to the diner. The scene dissolves, the fog of the woman's fate lifting as the guests find themselves once again in the dining room. The woman in black is silent, her expression blank, but her hands tremble ever so slightly. The other guests look at her, uneasy, their discomfort palpable. The host chuckles softly, swirling the wine in his glass. Ah, oh, what a tragedy, he murmurs. And yet, so fitting. The woman stares at the host, her lips parting, as if to protest, but no words come. Instead, she sits in stunned silence, the weight of her story hanging heavily in the air. The host leans forward, his eyes glittering with dark amusement. Who's next? The tension grows thicker with every passing moment. The woman in black remains seated, her face pale, her story weighing heavily on the group. The other guests exchange uneasy glances, unsure of what to expect next. The host's grin never falters as he turns his attention to the man sitting across from her. Ah, Mr Carter, the host says, his tone both amused and sinister. You've always had a fascination with things ancient, haven't you? Tell us, how far does your obsession go? The man, Carter, a tall figure with thinning hair and sharp features, clenches his fists on the table. His jaw tightens as he stares at the host, but he says nothing. The room begins to fade once more, and as the shadows creep in, the scene changes, drawing the guests into Carter's world. Story 3. The Pharaoh's Curse Carter has always been a man consumed by one passion, ancient Egypt. Though he wasn't born Egyptian, the culture, the mysteries, the grandeur of the pharaohs and the towering pyramids have captivated him his entire life. He works at a museum as a curator, specialising in Egyptian artefacts, and spends his days surrounded by relics of the past, mummies, sarcophagi, and all things ancient. It is an obsession that drives him. For Carter, Egypt is the pinnacle of human civilization. One evening, as he sips coffee with friends at a cafe, they engage in a heated debate about the construction of the pyramids. I'm telling you, one of his friends says with a smirk, the pyramids are impressive, sure, but nothing compared to modern engineering. Look at the skyscrapers we build today. The pyramids. Not that big a deal when you think about it. Carter slams his fist on the table, glaring at his friend. You're wrong. The pyramids are far more than just stone and mortar. They are a testament to intellect, spirituality and power beyond anything we have today. Everything about Egyptian civilization is superior, more advanced, more intellectual, more in tune with the cosmos. You're blind if you can't see it. His friends exchange awkward glances, shrugging off his outburst with uneasy laughter, but Carter seethes with frustration. He knows the truth. Egypt holds secrets far greater than anyone realises, and soon he will be closer to that truth than ever before. A few days later, an object arrives at the museum where Carter works. It is small and ancient, an exquisite golden scarab, encrusted with faded gems, its surface etched with hieroglyphs that speak of long-forgotten rituals. The moment Carter lays eyes on it, he feels a strange pull, an almost magnetic force drawing him closer. Ignoring the warning signs placed around the display, he reaches out and touches the scarab, brushing his fingers along its sharp edges. 
In an instant, a sharp pain shoots through his hand. He pulls back, staring at the fresh cut on his finger, blood dripping onto the museum floor. He shrugs it off at first, but as the days pass, strange things begin to happen. At night, Carter dreams of the museum, but not as he knows it. In his dreams, he wanders the dark, darkened halls, guided by something unseen. He watches himself perform rituals, arcane ceremonies, chanting in a language he has never learned, summoning powers he does not understand. The dreams grow more vivid each night, until he sees something that makes his blood run cold. An army of the dead, rising from the earth, marching under his command, unleashed upon the world. The nightmares haunt him, but they are not the only strange occurrences. Carter's colleagues and even his boss begin to notice his appearance. He looks sick, pale, gaunt, as if something is draining the life from him. Carter, you don't look well, his boss tells him one morning. Maybe you should take some time off. Carter snaps at him, his temper fraying at the edges. I'm fine. I don't need rest. I need to work. You wouldn't understand. He storms out of the room, only to find himself drawn back to the scarab. There, in the museum, he reads the plaque beneath the cursed object. The very scarab he had cut himself on. It describes the artifact as belonging to an ancient pharaoh, a ruler who had been buried with the intention of returning from the dead. The legend spoke of his oath to rise once more, bringing an army with him to reclaim the world. Suddenly, Carter catches a glimpse of his reflection in a nearby display case. What he sees chills him to the bone. There, in the glass, he doesn't just see himself. He sees something, someone clinging to him, a decayed figure, its skeletal arms wrapped around him like a parasite, its face twisted and grotesque. The pharaoh, he is there, draining Carter's life essence, feeding on his very soul, growing stronger while Carter grows weaker. Desperate, Carter visits a doctor. The doctor, after a brief examination, dismisses his concerns as exhaustion. But after running some tests, the doctor frowns at a strange anomaly in Carter's X-ray. It shows two sets of bones, Carter's and something else. Another figure, looming just behind him, its skeletal form intertwined with his. That's odd, the doctor says, shaking his head. Must be a mistake. But Carter knows better. The pharaoh is real and he is growing stronger. Whenever Carter looks into a mirror, the decaying figure is there, hovering just over his shoulder, draining him more and more each day. Carter feels his body weakening, his energy sapped, his mind slipping into madness, and as the days pass, the pharaoh's grip on him tightens. Finally, at his weakest, Carter collapses in his home, his body unable to resist any longer. He feels the ancient presence take over, flooding his veins with the power of the undead. His eyes snap open, but they are no longer his own. The pharaoh speaks through Carter's mouth, his voice ancient and cold. With this body, I shall raise my army of the dead, and I shall bring hell upon the earth. Carter, now nothing more than a vessel for the pharaoh, stands his body moving under the control of a force far older and darker than himself. He walks out into the night, his mind screaming, trapped inside his own body, as the pharaoh prepares to unleash his ancient curse upon the world. Back to the diner. The scene shifts back to the dining room, where the guests sit in stunned silence. Carter slumps in his chair, his face pale and drenched in sweat. He trembles, unable to meet the other's eyes, knowing that his story is far from over. The host chuckles darkly, raising his glass. Ah, the power of the ancients, and the price one must pay for such knowledge. Carter shivers, his hands gripping the table, as if trying to ground himself in reality. But the others know. It is already too late for him. 
The host's eyes gleam with wicked delight as he turns to the next guest. Shall we continue? The air is thick with tension as the host turns his gaze towards the final guest, a woman named Cathy. She shifts uneasily in her seat, sensing that her turn has come. The host, with a knowing grin, leans forward. Ah, Cathy, he says, his voice silky and mocking. An artist of sorts, I believe. Tell us, have you ever truly understood the depth of the art you work with? Or perhaps some pieces are better left forgotten. <laughs> Cathy stiffens, her fingers tightening around the stem of her wine glass. She opens her mouth to respond, but the room begins to fade, the edges of reality blurring as the story of her life takes shape. Cathy had always loved art. Her work as an art restorer allowed her to spend her days immersed in the beauty of the past, carefully preserving masterpieces that had stood the test of time. Her colleagues respected her skill, and the museum where she worked often entrusted her with delicate, centuries-old pieces. One day, Cathy is assigned a new project. A large, dark painting arrives at the museum, discovered in the basement of an old, decrepit mansion that had been abandoned for years. The painting is old, 17th century, they believe, and depicts a shadowy figure, a nobleman dressed in black, standing in a dimly lit room. The canvas is badly deteriorated, the colours faded and cracked, and the nobleman's face is almost entirely scratched out, as if someone had tried to erase his identity. Cathy is immediately drawn to it, feeling a strange, inexplicable connection to the piece. She's eager to restore it, to bring the figure back to life. But as soon as she begins her work, strange things happen. The first incident occurs late one night, when Cathy stays behind in the museum after hours. She's alone in the dimly lit restoration room, carefully working on the painting, when she hears a soft whisper, just barely audible, like the faintest breath of wind. She looks around, but there's no one there. She shrugs it off as her imagination, but over the next few days, the whispers grow louder, more persistent. They seem to come from the painting itself, a faint murmur of words she can't quite make out. Still, she tells herself it's nothing, just the isolation of working late at night. But then she begins having nightmares. In her dreams, Cathy finds herself wandering the museum's empty halls. The walls seem to stretch and warp, twisting in ways that make no sense. The light in flickers, and the temperature drops until her breath hangs in the air. In the distance, she sees the figure from the painting, but he's no longer confined to the canvas. He walks through the halls, moving toward her, his face still a blur, a shadow where his features should be. Each night, the dreams grow more vivid, more terrifying. The figure follows her, silent but relentless, his presence heavy with malice. During the day, Cathy throws herself into her work, determined to finish restoring the painting. But with each stroke of her brush, she notices something unsettling. The nobleman's face, once barely visible, is becoming clearer on its own. No matter how carefully she works, the image seems to restore itself faster than she can explain. Her colleagues notice her change in demeanour. They comment on how tired she looks, how pale and gaunt she's become. She brushes off their concerns, but deep down, she knows something is wrong. The painting is doing something to her, draining her energy, consuming her thoughts. Then, one afternoon, Cathy catches a glimpse of herself in a mirror. At first, she thinks it's just her reflection. She's tired after all, but then she notices something that makes her heart stop. Behind her, standing just over her shoulder, is the figure from the painting. His face is clearer now, no longer a blur. His eyes, hollow and dark, seem to pierce through her. She spins around, but no one is there. Terrified, Cathy digs deeper into the history of the painting. She discovers that it once belonged to a noble family, the last descendant of which vanished under mysterious circumstances. 
The painting had been scratched and damaged deliberately, she learns, by the nobleman himself before his death. The legend claimed that he had been cursed, his soul trapped within the portrait for eternity, seeking a vessel to escape. And now Cathy realises, with growing horror, she is that vessel. In a panic, Cathy tries to destroy the painting. She throws it to the ground, slashing at it with a knife, tearing at the canvas. But as she does, she feels an icy force gripping her, freezing her in place. The painting, despite her efforts, begins to mend itself. The rips close up, the scratches fade, and the nobleman's face becomes clearer than ever. In her reflection, Cathy sees the truth. The nobleman's spirit has latched onto her, draining her life force, slowly taking over her body. Her face has become gaunt, her skin pale, and her eyes hollow, just like his. Desperate, she seeks out help, but no one believes her. They say she's overworked, that she needs rest, but Cathy knows the truth. Every night, the figure in her nightmares gets closer. Every day, she feels weaker, her body no longer fully her own. Finally, it happens. One evening, as Cathy sits in her apartment, too weak to move, the painting comes to life. The nobleman steps out of the canvas, his figure tall and imposing, his face now fully restored. He smiles, a cold, cruel smile, as he approaches her. I've waited centuries for this, he whispers, his voice like a death rattle. You've given me what I needed, your life for mine. Cathy tries to scream, but no sound escapes her lips. The nobleman places his hand on her chest, and she feels her strength draining away completely. Her vision blurs, darkness closing in, as the nobleman takes her place in the world. The last thing Cathy sees before she slips into unconsciousness is her reflection in the window, her body now hollow, lifeless, trapped forever in the painting, her face frozen in silent terror. Back to the diner, the room snaps back into focus. Cathy sits in stunned silence, her face pale and drained, her hands shaking. The other guests stare at her in horror, their own fear reflected in her eyes. The host chuckles softly, swirling his wine. Ah, the price of art. Isn't it fascinating how far one can fall in the pursuit of beauty? Cathy opens her mouth to protest, but no words come. She sits motionless, trapped in the knowledge of her fate. The host, grinning with dark delight, rises from his seat. And now, my dear guests, I believe our dinner is complete. The main course. The air in the room grows impossibly thick, the tension palpable as the guests sit in stunned silence, each of them haunted by their own dark stories. The host, still grinning, takes a slow sip from his wine glass before setting it down with a deliberate clink. The sound echoes ominously through the room. He stands, adjusting his suit with an unsettling calmness, his gaze sweeping over each of the four guests. Harris, the swamp man, the woman in black, now pale as a ghost, Carter, still trembling from his encounter with the pharaoh, and Cathy, who barely seems to breathe after reliving her nightmare. You've all shared your stories, the host says, his voice low and almost mocking, but now it's time for the final part of our evening. The guests shift in their seats, unease growing into outright fear. Harris glances toward the door, but something is wrong. The heavy wooden doors, once slightly ajar, slam shut with a deafening thud. The windows, previously framed with velvet curtains, are now barred with thick wrought iron grates that slide into place with a sinister creak. The room is sealed tight, and there is no way out. What is this? Cathy whispers, her voice trembling. The host's smile widens, revealing sharp, gleaming teeth. Teeth that are far too long, too sharp for any human mouth. His eyes darken. 
the pupils elongating into narrow, predatory slits. The room grows colder, shadows creeping across the floor as if alive, writhing like serpents around the table. You see, the host continues, his voice now deeper, more guttural. The stories were merely the appetizers. His fingers lengthen, the nails curving into talon-like claws as his body begins to contort and twist. His skin ripples and darkens, muscles bulging under his clothes as they tear away, revealing a grotesque form underneath. His face elongates, his jaw unhinging like that of a serpent, rows of razor-sharp teeth glinting in the dim light. The guests are frozen in place, their horror mounting as they watch the host transform before their eyes. He is no longer a man, but something ancient and monstrous, a creature that has lurked in the shadows of nightmares for centuries, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. The main course, the creature snarls, its voice dripping with malevolence, is you. Harris leaps from his chair, scrambling for the door, but it's no use. The locks hold firm, the door unmoving. He pounds against it, screaming for help, but no one is coming. The creature moves faster than they can comprehend, its long clawed arms reaching out. Harris is the first to be dragged across the floor, his screams pierce in the silence as the creature's jaws descend upon him. Blood splatters across the floor, the sickening sound of flesh tearing fill in the room. The woman in black tries to crawl under the table, her hands shaking, but the creature is upon her next. Its talons pierce her skin as it drags her into the shadows, her cries of terror echoing in the darkness. Carter, pale and trembling, backs into a corner, muttering under his breath, trying to summon the strength to fight. But it's no use. The creature's gaze falls on him, its eyes glowing with hunger. With a single, swift movement, it lunges at him, its jaws clamping down, muffling his final scream. Kathy, the last remaining guest, stares in horror, her mind unable to process the carnage unfolding around her. She tries to run, but the shadows seem to pull at her, trapping her in place. The creature turns its attention to her, its monstrous face inches from hers, its breath hot and rancid. You've all shared such wonderful stories, it hisses, its voice a low growl, but nothing compares to the tale of a soul devoured. Kathy's scream is cut short as the creature sinks its fangs into her neck, the room filling with the grotesque sounds of feeding. The end. Outside, the mansion stands in eerie silence, its dark windows offering no glimpse of the horrors within. The once peaceful night is shattered by the sound of blood-curdling screams that echo through the air, only to be swallowed by the night. And then, silence.